Hello again. Wanted to start off this session by telling you that I am also joining the symposium from Gatineau, uh, which is the unceded traditional territory of the Algonquin, who are an Anishinaabe people. And I must admit that I have said that many times since I moved here in 2020. But this time, as I sat down to write and prepare for this session, I found myself really struck by the word unceded. There's no treaty or agreement in place with Indigenous people on this land, and I find myself asking what that means for a path forward. Like, what can I do? As I reflected and thought about it, ultimately, I was reminded that my role and responsibility is to educate myself and to share what I learned. So I wanted to share a couple of books with you really quickly. Um, this one here is called Treaty Words. It's by Amy Craft with uh, illustrations by Luke Swinson. It's a, it's a short book, um, but a beautiful, beautiful read um, about the Indigenous view of treaties and what a treaty means. And then this one here, Namwayat, I hope I am saying that correctly, Namwayat by Chief Robert Joseph. I hope that you will seek them out and read them and share them again and again and again. One of the most beautiful things out of this book is reconciliation belongs to everyone. So thank you. It's now my pleasure to introduce Courtney Morrison. Courtney Morrison joins us today from the Eastern Township School Board, where she sits on the Committee for Truth and Reconciliation in Education and the Inclusion, Diversity, Equity and Access, or IDEA, Committee. I've had the pleasure to work remotely with Courtney through QSLIN for the past three years, and I know her to be thoughtful, well-spoken, and committed to continual learning. So it's my pleasure to introduce you to her today. Good morning, Courtney. I can see you're getting ready for us, so I'll just keep going with the technical tidbits for everyone. Courtney will also be asking you for some interaction in the chat when she starts her presentation, so do listen for that cue. There will be a question period after Courtney's presentation, so we'll turn the chat back on uh, for you to, to drop your questions in then, or you can use the raise hand function and ask your question live if you prefer. We will also share Courtney's slides uh, after the session, so no worries there. And of course, lastly, for anyone um, who would like to review the whole session later, we are recording, so if you do not wish to be on the video, go ahead and turn your camera off. It will be shared on the QSLIN YouTube channel. So with all of that technical information out of the way, I will turn everything over to Courtney. Courtney, welcome and thank you so much for being here for us for this presentation today. So thank you, Erin, for the wonderful um, introduction. I'm working off of a very small screen, so I, I can't see everyone, but um, I know that you're listening. So good morning and welcome to the presentation on the Caring Library, Removing Berries to Foster Belonging for uh, all students. So this presentation uh, will focus on being more mindful of our practices and how they might be exclusionary without us being aware that they are and how to uh, remove those barriers to create um, a library space where students feel like they belong. So hello everyone. I am Courtney Morrison, the uh, school board librarian for um, Eastern Township School Board. So I've been at the board for about five years now. And um, I would like to mention that I'm uh, a guest on the uh, unceded traditional lands of the Abenaki people where I'm from in the Eastern Townships. Um, and I wanna start this presentation by saying that I I'm not an expert in this subject. I don't have all the answers, um, but there's like, I'm always learning. And um, even though there's a lot that I don't know. So it could be that you are more of an expert than me. And in that case, please feel free to share with the group because I am big on sharing and collaborating and having open discussions. So my email is on the slide. If you would like to contact me after, if you have any questions or would like to just have a chat with me, I don't hesitate to, uh, to reach out. So just to give you some context about my work and what I've been doing, 
um, with the board. So I, I make the work of inclusion and diversity a necessary component of my daily work and my life practices. And I, I don't treat it as an add-on. So it doesn't matter your background, what position you have, where you work. This is the work of everyone. And it's it's a shared collective responsibility. So through um, a lot of research, a lot of PD, a lot of collaboration with people outside of my uh, immediate circle, it allowed me to gain a different and deeper understanding and perspective on things like white privilege and how systems based on certain ideology were intentionally built to keep others down. So I've had to do a lot of unlearning and I've had to face the reality that a lot of our libraries are full of barriers and biases that I hadn't even thought of. And a huge part of these um, barriers and biases has to do with the language and the terms that we use. So specifically the terms that we use to categorize books, to describe our books, to the hierarchical systems that we use to uh, organize our books. So those barriers and biases are embedded in all facets of our society. So this work requires a lot of practice and a lot of reflection and curiosity. And sometimes it can also be a shift in mindset because it could be a different way of seeing ourselves and the role that we play in being safe for others. So what we will be learning today, we will be talking about relationships and connections at the center. This is the, the most important thing. And then we will be going over the power of language and having a common understanding, which is so, so crucial. So we'll talk about the definitions of belonging, colonialism, uh, decolonization, indigenization, diversity and inclusion. Then we'll look at identifying what those barriers and biases are in libraries. Um, specifically, I'll talk a little bit about cataloging, uh, classification and subject headings, and then we'll talk a little bit about space and activities. And then we'll, we will end the session with um, suggestions to help you start your journey. I Just a quick note, I won't be going over collection development, not because it's not important, important, but um, I think Kelsey Bogan did a wonderful job last year at talking about the importance of positive representation and auditing our collections last year. And also, I just don't have time to today, uh, but I do have resources in the ending slides um, talking about uh, collection development. Belonging. So I'd like everyone to take a moment to reflect on what the word belonging means to you. What does it look like? What does it feel like? Um, how do you know when you belong and how do you feel when you know you belong? So visualize what this looks like and throughout the session, uh, remember that feeling or the words that you associate belonging with. So please feel free to share in the chat what uh, belonging means to you. I would love to hear your or read your thoughts on belonging. Cherish, wonderful, safety, to be yourself, confidence, wonderful, exactly. Authenticity, authenticity is a, is a really big one. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. A spark, thank you so much for sharing. These are wonderful. Comfort, yes, absolutely. Freedom, yeah. Yeah, I think for me, being able to be comfortable in the space and something that's really important to me is, is being able to contribute to my community. Um, and also things that I know that could potentially harm people is not tolerated. So that's another um, important thing to me. Welcoming, yep. Being able to relax, yep. Absolutely. Yeah, respect is is huge and caring as well. And I was reading um, an article by Ted Shadok called Mapping, I don't remember what it's called, Mapping Sense of Belonging in Library Spaces. And it stated that there is a correlation between student sense of belonging and student academic success. So the article talks about uh, four facets of 
uh, student belonging, so psychological, spatial, cultural, and sociocultural. And in that article, there were many student interviews, and they talked about caring a lot. So students felt like they belonged in the library when they felt cared for, when the people around them cared about them. Um, so the caring piece is really, really important. Yeah, so thank you for sharing in the chat. Let's talk about building relationships and connections. So say our goal for the library is to create a sense of belonging. So why would we do this? How would we do this? The, the why would be the well-being and safety of students and staff and for them to be able to express themselves authentically without harm. So being able to express yourself authentically without harm is very much a privilege. And it's generally a privilege of the dominant culture. So when we talk about inclusion and removing barriers, our goal for doing all of that is the well-being and safety of students and staff. So now that we know our why, how would we do that? So we would first do that by forming, building, and maintaining relationships and connections with them. So this is the most important thing. And so that's at the center. And then all of the other the other activities like programming, book displays, uh, collection development, that would be done to support those relationships. But of course, it can go both ways where uh, these pieces can be working together to create that sense of belonging and that well-being and that safety. So uh, like for an example, if you start with uh, modeling inclusive language, it could help open the door to fostering those relationships. So I primarily look at it from the perspective of working from the inside out. But again, um, it might not always work that way. Um, that's why the arrows are there. And um, it could be that these pieces work together to create that sense of belonging. So um, quickly, I'll just go over a couple strategies for relationship building with students. Um, these strategies you could also use with the adults in your life as well. It uh, just doesn't have to be with students. So the first one would be active listening. <laughs> and I know this one might seem like common sense, but it's a skill that needs to be practiced. And I know a lot of adults in my life that don't have this skill. So it takes practice to actively listen, to be engaged with someone, to be present in the moment, and I know that can be tricky and, and hard in today's society with, with information overload, but it is so crucial. So try your best not to interrupt their thoughts. Try to refrain from giving advice unless it's asked for. Uh, but most times people tell you things not for advice. It's just because they need to be heard. Um, number two, which I'm, I'm glad that... Uh, everyone talked a lot about this in the last session, um, is taking an interest in them. So get to know them, ask them questions, what interests them, sit down and have a conversation with them. Um, it's really important, especially to, to them feeling like they care and them being engaged in the space. Number three, position them as competent and work collaboratively with them. So when we position students as competent, we are not focusing on what they're doing wrong. Um, I could almost guarantee that they're hyper aware of what they're doing wrong, and they probably don't need any more reminders. This might be the only message that they are receiving. So instead, we can raise the bar, we can expect better, we can have clear norms and expectations, we can model what we want them to do. And if you formed a connection with them, chances are that they will raise to your expectation. And by positioning students so that their strengths are um, highlighted, it brings down cortisol levels, it enables them to take in what they're hearing, what they're learning, and ultimately you are creating a better environment for them to learn. And they will be more able to contribute positively to their community. 
So, which brings me to my next point. So having a connection with students doesn't mean that there are no boundaries. And Laura mentioned this um, in the last session. You can have both, but your approach to those boundaries or those rules matter. So how you approach them really does matter. So you can have a relationship with them, but you can also maintain um, clear norms and expectations and boundaries. Um, collaboration is also really, really important. So work collaboratively with them, bring them in on projects, let them have a voice, let them have a choice in the library, um, have things that engage them that they find interesting. Collaboration though has to have a purpose or a goal that you are working on together. And lastly, the, the practice of responding versus reacting. And this has been um, something that has been really valuable to me on this journey. And it's something that can be practiced in everyday life, not just something to consider when we're dealing with um, an issue in the library or with a student. Um, but I know this is really hard to do because our gut reaction sometimes is to just react. And a lot of time it can be pretty harsh or unkind, but by taking the time to pause before we respond, it puts us in control of our emotions. It puts us in a better decision-making uh, space. Um, and most importantly, it's crucial because the goal is to bring people in, not to call them out. So we're not, it's not to humiliate the students or to alienate them or to make them fear you, which tends to happen when we call people out. So this would not be fostering a community of belonging. Calling out tends to be like an act of shaming, even though that might not be the intent. I like I sometimes when we call out the intent is to educate, but it really ends up being an act of shaming. So calling in is about having a conversation. It's about asking uh, further questions. It's about listening and it's about moving forward with compassion and respect. The power of language and breaking down barriers. So the terms and expressions that we use absolutely matter. So certain words or terms can make people or groups feel excluded and they can really, really perpetuate harmfully stereotypes and expectations and limitations about people. So language has the power to shape our values, our attitudes, and our beliefs. Language has the power to break people down, but also has the power to build people up. It has the power to remove many barriers for our students. So increasing the inclusiveness of our language means that we are striving to understand the ways in which language often unconsciously makes assumptions about people. And it's about being aware that language can unintentionally reinforce those, those dominant norms. So when we talk about inclusive language, it's really about using the principle of, um, of person first where we value a person as a whole. And it also removes barriers and exclusions and stereotyping and biases, and it's, it's free from harmful labels. So I'd like to just take a minute. I know that was already a lot of information. And I would like to ask everyone to reflect on some questions around language. So what is the cost of not using inclusive and affirming language? What message does that tell our students and colleagues? And what harm does that do to them when we don't use inclusive language? So I have done um, a number of workshops on respectful and inclusive language at my board. And what I often find is that there is a lot of uncertainty around terms like inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility. And I find it's it's hard to move forward without having a concrete understanding of those terms. 
which brings me to um, the definitions so that we can all have a common understanding. So what is inclusion? What does inclusion mean to you? Inclusion is really about having an active and intentional and, and continuous um, process that respects and promotes all people as value members of society. It, so it acknowledges the value of an individual as a whole. And um, it's about fostering a sense of belonging and acceptance. So now I'm going to mention why I use this term with caution. I've always felt a little uneasy about the words diversity and inclusion, but I never really, really knew why until I attended a presentation by Jesse Wente, which I have his book right here. So Jesse Wente uh, is the author of Unreconciled. It's an amazing, um, amazing book. And he, he said that the issue with the term inclusion is that there is a dominant group that um, gets who that gets to decide who um, who when and where others are included. So there's a power imbalance that places one group of people at the top. And it also fails to recognize that some groups may not want to be included, that some groups are not equity seeking groups, but are sovereignty seeking groups, as would be the case for indigenous indigenous communities. So it was a real eye opener for me, and it just made me more mindful of how um, how I'm using that term and in what context. Um, it also the word inclusion also gives like the impression that all is needed to do is to include. So for an example, like saying, well, we invited them to, to the party. So now like our job is done. We don't have to do anything else, but there's a lot more that goes into it. And we need to be asking ourselves things like, did they even want to go to the party? Um, did they have a say in how it was organized? Did they get to collaborate? Did they get to, to run the, the planning committee? So there's, there's all of these, these other um, pieces in it than just inclusion. Diversity, this is another tricky one. Generally speaking, when we say um, diverse, or when we're talking about, like when we say diverse, we're talking about all of the varied human experiences and perspectives in the world. But there's this misconception that diversity means anything outside of the, the dominant culture. So anything outside of the cisgender, heteronormative, Christian point of view. And so we unintentionally create othering because we, we are creating this us versus them narrative. So we have to be very mindful of how we're using the term. We should be using the term to define a composition of a group rather than the individual. So diversity is not an identity and it's not a genre. So for an example, you could have a diverse classroom, a diverse school, a diverse book collection, or you could have um, diverse activities in the library that interest many students, but you would not say that a student is diverse because they don't meet that white cisgender heteronormative uh, group. Um, we could also create othering with how we label books. So another example would be labeling a book as diverse because it doesn't feature uh, a non, sorry, because it features a non-white character. And I've made this mistake before, but now I know better. And I just call them books and I explain why they are great books, just like I would with any books that feature white characters or straight characters. Um, another example of othering that I'd like to mention because it does come up quite a bit um, is the labeling of a of a washroom as gender neutral. I think a lot of times there's a misunderstanding around the meaning of gender neutral as well as transgender. So the labeling really, really targets certain groups of people and like negatively. And so a better approach 
would be just to call the washroom a washroom or an accessible washroom for everyone. So no need for the label. Um, so this washroom is for everyone. It's inclusive. It's accessible. It um, maximizes safety and privacy. Sorry about that. I skipped a slide, a really important slide. Um, so a few more definitions. So colonization. So if we want to contribute to change and remove barriers and biases related to language, a good place to start is having a concrete um, definition that would provide a good foundation for further, for further learning. So I'd like everyone to, to reflect on um, the systems, the beliefs, the practices, uh, and the people that created libraries. So what's the history there? Libraries today are seen as social justice advocates. We hold up the belief of freedom to read. We celebrate intellectual freedom. Uh, we, we engage in anti-racism efforts. Uh, we engage in inclusion and accessibility. But reflecting deeper on colonial ideologies gives us a better understanding of just how embedded and present those barriers are in library practices. So for an example, libraries are foundationally based on the written word. So we they're very literature based and we value this and we value having quality text and books and we pride ourselves on having great collections that serve everyone. But let's Let's pause for a second and think about this a little bit more. Who are we excluding by valuing literature-based knowledge as superior to other forms of knowledge transfer? So because libraries are traditionally based on the written word, they automatically pose, um, pose a barrier to communities that are orally based. And there's a word for this, kind of racism, but it's it's escaping me right now. But um, we we see this bias when people dismiss audiobooks as real reading. And I, I, I don't know, but I get this quite a bit where audiobooks are not taken as seriously, I guess, as print books. And like oral literacy and storytelling has been around much, much longer than the written word. And if you read studies about this, it shows that the semantic processing for reading or listening happens in the same areas, but areas of the brain. So there's very little difference when it comes to comprehension, whether you're reading or listening. And uh, when you're listening to a story, it may also create deeper connections and empathy because you can hear the storyteller's voice. So the, the narrative that libraries are for everyone is quite far from the truth because not everyone experiences libraries the same and many of those experiences are more harmful to certain communities. So this brings me to uh, colonialism. I really like uh, Carson Quetzala. I hope I pronounced her name correctly. She has a really great TED talk called The Pedagogy of Decolonizing. And she says that colonization is when a small group of people impose their own practices, norms, and values. And again, we can see this in all of our institutions, and I like her definition because oftentimes when we think about the word colonization, it's about the taking away of land, but it's much, much, much deeper than that as well. And sometimes we forget that there is also this cognitive imperialism that has taken place. Um, the decolonization, Decolonization is the process of, of um, deconstructing, dismantling colonial ideologies and approaches. So it's about weeding out uh, Western biases or assumptions that have impacted um, other communities' way of being. 
Nikki Sanchez also has a really great TED Talk called Decolonization is the Work of Everyone. So we are all part of colonial history. And at a basic level, decolonization starts with yourself. So it's a it's about examining who we are, engaging in self-reflection, allowing ourselves to be uncomfortable and unlearning and removing uh, practices that are harmful to others. So we can ask ourselves, what are we going to stop doing or unlearn in order to make us safe for others? Indigenization involves Indigenous perspectives and approaches. So it it means that it's being led by Indigenous people where they bring Indigenous ways of knowing, being, and doing into spaces that typically are not designed for uh, their way of being. So unlike decolonization, indigen Indigenization is the work of Indigenous people. So it's an intentional approach of integrating Indigenous practices, ideas, and ceremonies. But again, it must be done by an Indigenous person or a community. So for an example, if you wanted to do some kind of activity that was based on Indigenous knowledge or practice, it must be led by an Indigenous person. This, this is not the same as talking about truth and reconciliation in schools. Um, it's, it's not it's not the same the same thing. So a really great book I would uh, like to recommend is Dr. Pamela Toulouse's uh, book called Truth and Reconciliation in Canadian Schools. So it's a really easy read. It has lots of uh, book suggestions and activities for each grade level. Um, so if you're looking for a place to start to talk about uh, truth and reconciliation, this is a good one. Uh, and I also would recommend uh, Joe Corona, her uh, book called Wehiwa, Indigenous Pedagogies, an Act for Reconciliation and Anti-Racism or Anti-Racist Education. So that's also a really, a really good one to check out. Okay, so we've gone over belonging. Um, we've gone over relationships and connections being at the center, um, being our focus, uh, being our goal and our why. So now um, I'm going to just jump in and talk about addressing biases and barriers in cataloging, specifically subject headings. I could probably guarantee that most people here are more of an expert at cataloging than I am. Like I, I had to admit it's not my favorite thing to do, but when I do do it, which is quite often, I I still engage in critical cataloging and I'm still mindful of how I'm cataloging. And I just wanted to open up the conversation around the harmful terms that can be found in subject headings. And there are unfortunately many, many, many problematic subject headings. And when I say problematic, I mean that a lot of them are racist and you will find that these problematic subject headings, the terms are not accurate, they're harmful, um, and they're offensive, particularly around people and groups of people. So one of the, I guess, better known problematic subject heading is illegal alien, and it was finally changed in 2021, um, and it was changed to like a combination of terms of non-citizens and illegal immigration. But this was an uphill battle. Uh, there's a really great documentary called um, Change the Subject, where a group of college students from Dartmouth um, challenged this. And uh, it just talks about their, their struggles with this. And like even those new terms, non-citizens and illegal immigration, they're not great. It still vilifies people. It still targets people because when we think about it, a human being is not illegal. Um, another well-known problematic subject heading is Indians of North America. As far as I know, uh, Library of Congress has not updated this term but Library of Archives in Canada has modified 
a lot of subject headings related to Indigenous people. And so Indians of North America is now Indigenous people. And they've also made a lot of changes to um, the names of Indigenous communities so that they reflect the terms that those communities use to refer to themselves. So we are moving away from the English terms that were imposed on Indigenous communities. So what can we do about this? We can we can engage in critical librarianship. So this means that we are going beyond information literacy and that we are challenging oppressive concepts of gender and sexual identity. It means that we are being critical of organizing by gender binary categories. And it means that we are challenging the misrepresentation of non-white people in cataloging and that we are really addressing the microaggressions in librarianship. So staying neutral upholds the status quo and the status quo upholds an oppressive system. We could also consider reporting problematic subject headings. And you can do this through the, um, the website, the cataloging lab, it's linked in the slides. You could also consider implementing local subject headings. And I know some people may feel uncomfortable doing this, but as I mentioned, upholding like it's not okay to be neutral anymore so that's really upholding the status quo and that's not it's not really okay so um we could consider implementing local subject headings and there are a number of ways you could do this that would still ensure uh, consistency and accessibility and retrieval so uh, there's a also a few slides or a few resources in the ending slides that talk about this if you would like more information about it and lastly, because there's a lot to do in terms of tackling problematic subject headings, if you're looking for a place to start where you're just focusing on one project at a time, I would suggest uh, starting with changing the problematic subject headings around Indigenous communities and people. And there's a lot of libraries that are doing this. Uh, my board started doing this. and. Um, Gosh, I wish I could talk more about this, but <laughs> but if uh, if you would if you are interested in starting this project, I have some really great resources uh, in in the slides. So this brings us to um, classification. As I mentioned before, the language, the methods uh, that we use to organize books, to describe books, and the terms that we use to access books um, has not only been exclusionary, which was the intention, but it's also been very harmful to those communities that fall outside of the dominant culture. And there are many, many articles out there that talk about the systemic racism embedded in classification systems like Dewey. The Dewey decimal system is like, you can't avoid it. It's it's there. It's, it's racist, it's sexist, it's homophobic. Um, you will find the separation of peoples, of histories. So for an example, Black history is not part of American history, even though Black history is American history. You will also find this with Indigenous histories, which is Canadian history. Um, in earlier editions, almost anything written by or about non-white people was classified in the 300s. So everything from the arts to biography to history was placed in a different category if it was about or from a non-white perspective. So women's work is in a different category from jobs. Uh, the 200s, it's nearly dedicated all to Christianity, um, LGBTQ plus materials, they were once put in abnormal psychology and then neurolog neurological disorders. Uh, today, I think they're in 306.7, which is under sexual orientation. But again, like they're people, so they should technically be in 305, which is for groups of people. And for sure, for sure, the system is an imbalance of power. It's a hierarchy system, 
which means that a group of a group of people got to decide where things went and who was labeled. So what can we do to help address these biases and barriers? So we could consider reclassifying where we um, put things. And I imagine a lot of you are already doing this practice and that is um, fantastic. So some areas you might want to consider is in the is in the 200. So you could dedicate more classes to leave room for other religions. You could also consider leaving room, um, or sorry, also putting some of the 300s in the 900s so that it would address those separation issues, the that othering that you that we get. Um, we could also con consider contributing to Dewey. So we could propose changes to the DDC. And you can do this by going on the website, the Dewey contributors. You might consider going with a modified version of Dewey or going with something completely different. Um, in my board, we have one school that genreified the fiction collection, and then they're using um, Kelsey Bogan's modified system for nonfiction. And then I have another, uh, there's another elementary school system or elementary school library that used um, kind of like the same approach as what Joan Frazier did um, at New Frontier. And I th she presented Going Dewey Free at the 2017 Cuseland Symposium. So I, I know this issue is not new and we are seeing more and more that librarians and libraries are doing this really important work and, and we, are, we are actively and intentionally dismantling an oppressive system and we are engaging in really important continuous critical and reflective practices by removing barriers for students and, um, and just being uncomfortable with the status quo and um, and most importantly that we are building those really meaningful relationships and connections with students. I wanted to highlight someone in the library profession that has really paved the way for alternative classification systems. So on the picture on the right is Dorothy Porter. Uh, Dorothy was a she, or she was the chief librarian at Howard University from 1930 until her retirement 43 years later. So she built one of the world's leading repositories for Black history and culture known as the Howard Moreland Spingarn Research Center. So she not only collected and preserved works on Black history, perspective, and culture, but she also brought to the forefront that these works needed new approaches and how they were organized and assessed and cataloged. And she really criticized current systems for being too, and I quote, reflective of the way whites thought of the world. She was the first black woman to receive a library science degree from Columbia. And so Dorothy looked at the power dynamics of existing systems and she asked a really important and, and critical questions like who created the system what were they what were their ideologies because they were the ones that got to decide who was labeled who was not labeled and where they were placed so addressing biases and barriers in your space these are more this is more like a like like um, self-reflection questions to ask yourself when you're thinking about your space and removing barriers so that students can feel like they belong, that they are accepted, that they can contribute positively to their community, um, a space where they feel like they can achieve. So can all students see themselves in the space? So this means looking at uh, media, looking at your posters, looking at your uh, art installations, looking at materials. Is there positive representation all year round? Is there an overrepresentation of Christian decor in the library, mostly around Christmas time? So is your decor mostly linked to a specific 
religion or race or culture or ability or gender or sexual uh, identity. I know Christmas is a big one. Um, so we could consider doing, instead of doing Christmas decorations, we could do themes. So we could do, obviously we could do like a winter theme. Uh, we could look at more like winter wonderland themes. We could uh, talk about snow and the activities that we can do, um, things like that. So is the physical space and furniture accessible to everyone? So do the kids get a choice where they get to sit? What about the shelving height? Can students easily plug in computers and devices? Is the furniture easy to move? Are they allowed to move the furniture? Um, what about railing height? So you might be in a position where there's stairs leading up to your library. Um, what about the height of the railing? Um, dimmable lights, which I'm really glad that Rowan brought this up because it's huge. Like we don't think sometimes about how lights affect us and make us feel. Um, so you might consider, I know in a lot of our schools, we can't dim the lights, unfortunately, but um, you could consider having lamps on the tables or having those, those tall standing uh, lamps. You could consider um, less, I don't want to say less toxic cleaning supplies, but more um, non-allergenic cleaning products. And um, and then how are your books organized? Are there possible instances of othering? Um, are your book labels inclusive? So programs and activities. Um, yeah, so are, are the activities and crafts inclusive that you do? Are they respectful of different experiences and perspectives? For an example, Mother's Day and Father's Day, I know this one would typically be more like elementary school, but um, like this activity can be quite exclusionary to many family situations and types. So an, uh, an alternative could be uh, like special person day or the people that I love day or things that I love. Um, do the songs and stories that you use in the library have racist or and or discriminatory origins. So research the songs, research the terms that are used. Many nursery rhymes have some pretty horrific origins. Um, avoid assigning gender roles to activities and tasks. So like for an example, maybe we rethink about asking the boys to carry, carry heavy objects while the girls are responsible for cleanup. Um, do students have access to assistive technology in the library? And when I mean students, I mean every student, not just the ones that have IEPs. So does everyone have access to technology and assistive technology in the library? Is the catalog accessible? Do your videos have closed captioning? Um, actually, this one last week, I was reading that about 40% of Netflix users uh, use subtitles, even though most don't have a hearing impairment. So accessibility is about removing barriers that so that it benefits everyone. Does uh, the library have a range of accessible materials and items? So a, a big one right now is lending out um, or having accessible sensory bins or kits. So they would not just have like the fidget toys inside them, but they would have things like uh, noise canceling headphones or um, sunglasses if it's too bright in the library. And are the materials placed in like somewhere where they can be more easily accessible? Are there opportunities for all students to participate and collaborate? Do you have materials and items from multiple perspectives uh, and experiences? This means having positive stories too. Um, does the library have clear norms and expectations around kindness and respect and mindfulness? And um, are you mindful of respecting 
um, of respecting not having tests or projects or meetings or presentations on religious holidays. Do you have clear and visual signage? What does your, your labels look like? What fonts and colors are you using? Do you have a visual schedule? And this one, the last one is a big one. It's about examining the code of conduct and behavior policies. So do they lend to policing certain students more? Um, yeah, so please please check out your, your uh, code of conduct and behavior policies. When I started to look at, like really look at the biases and barriers in library practices, I came across a lot of articles like called decolonize the library or like inclusion in the library or equity centered library practices, but they they never really said what exactly those barriers were. So um, I thought to myself, it's really hard to unlearn something or stop doing something if you're not aware of it. So every time I came across something concrete that gave me an example of a barrier or a bias, I put it in a chart and this chart ended up being many pages long. So then I eventually took that information and I created a reflection tool, which is linked in the slide. And um, so it's basically broken down into, into four main areas and I will eventually work on adding cataloging to that as well. So it's just a tool if you are interested in, in checking it out later. I'm going to end the session with what can we do? So I talked about what we can do with cataloging, um, with subject headings and classification, but in general, it starts with us. So it starts with um, yourself and you don't have to wait for your school or your board to start doing something. We can start by learning and unlearning and engaging in awareness and practice and just being curious. We can uh, walk boldly towards our, our biases. So Vernon Myers has a really great TED talk called uh, Walk Boldly Towards Our Biases. And I encourage everyone to face them in deep and meaningful ways. And not all bias is bad, but the ones that perpetuate and sustain racism and stereotypes and harm really need to be confronted. And because we we create stories about people before we've even met them. So we need to disassociate those harmful associations that we've made about people. And we do this by boldly facing them. We can learn more about implicit bias. So there's a, a resource on the slide called Implicit Bias Module Series. And um, it talks about the different kinds of implicit bias. It talks about how to combat unconscious bias and micro microaggressions and misunderstandings and misconceptions. Again, we need to center relationships and connections at the, at, as the most important of, of, uh, of what we're doing. Uh, we could share our learning with others. Uh, know your why and set clear goals. Feedback. Feedback is so important. So get feedback from students, from colleagues, and enact, enact on the feedback that you're getting. Um, ask for guidance from knowledgeable sources if you feel stuck or if you need more information or you're not sure uh, where to go next. Um, and this is a multifaceted approach. So there are many areas that need to be worked on but start with one project at a time. Compassion fatigue and burnout is very real in this profession. So do what you can, when you can, try not to feel guilty because guilt paralyzes us. It doesn't move us forward. So one project at a time, small steps uh, forward. And lastly, this work is hard but it's so important to the well-being of our students. So we also must take care of ourselves 
and we need to be well, and we need to practice self-care to sustain the work. So thank you everyone for listening. I've gone a little bit over time, but if there's any questions, um, please, uh, please reach out. Thank you so much, Courtney. We do have a couple minutes if anyone has any questions. The chat has been enabled again, if you'd like to drop any questions or comments in there. Oh, that's wonderful. So lots of stuff coming through the chat. That's great. It's so much to think about, right? I mean, as I said, um, as Rowan was finishing, I was like, I don't want to end this session. I don't want to end this one either. I think we need to, um, I think we all need to petition our superiors to have the Kuslin symposium be like a retreat that we all get to go to for a week. And then we can really start to get into some of these topics because like Christopher said at the beginning, it, it can never be exhaustive. We have one day one hour at a time to be together. And Courtney, you've given us so much to think about. Our jobs are so layered and multidimensional, right? A lot of people from the outside in, I think, feel like we're just shuffling books around, right? And some days it has to be that, no question about it. Some days we have to put the books back on the shelf uh, or the library doesn't work, but there's more to it. For sure. Lots of stuff in the chat here. Oh, this year I absolutely refused to have any Christmas decorations in my library. This year for the 30% of our students who are not Christian. Yeah. My, oh, the book display was cooking fiction and cookbooks. But that's a wonderful share. Thank you. Very informative. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. There's only five minutes before the next sessions are scheduled to start. So I will wrap it up. Um, Courtney, as always, your your presentations and your thought, you're so thoughtful and thought provoking. And I thank you so much for for um, bringing the presentation to us this morning. I want to say big thank you to Trish, who was our captioner for this session. Thank you, Trish. And I want to say a big thank you to Laura Wolf, who was our technician for this session. Have a quick stretch, fill up your water again, and then uh, we'll see you back in your next sessions. Thank you so much, everyone.